Okay, so Delphi has hit the button, which means Good. that we are now recording. And here we go. All right, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and special good afternoon to everyone who is in Melbourne or Victoria, somewhere near where I am, here on the lands of the Boonwurrung and the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, it's, yeah, big hugs to all of us after the news today, um, and um, hopefully everyone supporting each other and doing all the right things so that we can stay safe and look after each other. Uh, I can see people starting to come in. Please, as you come in, um, let us know using the chat where you are, what country you're on, um, so that we can um, get to know there's just a dozen or so of us here um, so far. We've also got Penelope Benton, our general manager, is on the chat um, and um, uh, I can see also, yes, a few people coming in, a few people typing. Um, there is also, as ever, everyone, our session is being recorded and uh, the recording and the transcription will be available tomorrow. Uh, it is also being live captioned. And hello again to Helen, our captioner, who is in Brisbane. And Penelope has posted um, the link to the live captioning, um, which I've just pinned to the top of the chat there. So you can click on that anytime um, and our words will appear as though by magic with thanks to Helen. Um, and often if the internet connection's not great, it is, it is a good thing to just be able to pop open and see all of that appear. Hello, Wu Wen Yu again from Taiwan. Uh, Shelley from Clunes. Um, Shelley, whose country is Clunes? Is that Jaja Wurrung country? Um, oh, and hello, Susan Owen from the Melbourne Prize. How lovely to see everyone. Ebony on Darug country, nice to see you again. Um, great to see people coming in. Now, as Penelope has noted in the top of the chat there, this is week 14 of the NAVA Advocacy Program um, called Insights from the Inside this week. We've had, I'm going to try sharing um, the screen. Hopefully this will work well. Um, here is um, um, our program. Um, for the next, for, for this little chunk, these few weeks, because we've had um, we've had our first weeks looking at um, arts issues with some great uh, guests, including our Arts Down the Hill artists from last year. Uh, so four weeks with a focus on advocating the arts. We've then had a four-week focus on understanding policy development with some um, leaders in that area, some really great um, thinkers and practitioners. We then had four weeks on understanding the media so that we're really doing that um, kind of comprehensive approach to advocacy, looking at the issues, looking at policy development, looking at media engagement, and now four weeks on understanding the politics. Um, uh, sessions on political engagement, how to meet with a politician and then uh, getting um, getting ready for Arts Down the Hill on the 12th of August. Now, I'm just going to turn that off. For those who um, will recall the several times in the last couple of months that I've been really concerned that my internet was going to fall through because I kept getting that little warning saying it was unstable, you'll be delighted to hear that it was upgraded this morning. And thanks to the good people of the internet gods, um, I'm now flying. Uh, so we're going to be fine. Thank goodness. Um, so, Today's session, some insights from the inside, asking um, those questions about what is that relationship between um, um, political strategy, between public sentiment and policy? Um, what's, the, what's the connection uh, between those various ways that um, uh, parliamentarians make decisions, the advice they get and the strategists who work with them? And our guest today, and I'm delighted um, that he's here to join us, is Mark Texter from Crosby Texter. Mark and I have had some great conversations for many, many years um, about a whole range of the things that, that drive our passions in particular around arts and creativity, but also around a whole lot of other things. Mark, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. Good to have you join us. Uh, I can see several others joining us. There is Michaela from Luton in the UK. It's very early in the morning there, so always delighted to see Michaela. Anna from West of Victoria on uh, Wattajalik. 
Jad, Wajad Wajali, Wagai, and Japalak people. Um, and uh, Shelley on Wadawarin country. Uh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. So, so many things to talk about with Mark. I know everyone's going to have lots of questions. Mark's going to join us for an hour up until five, and then we'll go into the workshop session uh, as part of our uh, weekly program. So, Mark, tell me first of all, what led you to where you are today? What 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 background, what what interests and roles and so on took you uh, to where you are with Crosby Texter today? Well, we 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 I was um, I got into to politics and polling by by accident or happenstance. <laughs> um, mm. I was a econometrician with the Australian Bureau of Statistics, working on a thing called the Household Expenditure Survey in which people keep four weeks of diaries about every single thing they purchase, including a packet oh, of... Oh, how fascinating. And, uh, you know, everything in their in their basket and uh, everything, every single thing they earn. And that's and that's uh, designed to work out what should be in the CPI, um, this Consumer Price Index, to work out what people buy so we can price it properly. And it's done every four years. Very controversial s study because... 7,000 people have to fill in a diary every day for four weeks or so about every single thing they purchase. So I had enough of that of being abused by, by, by respondents <laughs> and um, ended up working for the Northern Territory Government as an economist in the Chief Minister's office, helping to do trade offset deals with the Indonesians to devalue, the, for example, the, 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 the value of certain trade concessions, you know, cattle versus other things. Um, and then they had an election and they wanted to know whether I knew how to poll um, and conduct polling. Well, I didn't, uh, actually. <laughs> That's a turn, uh, but, so I read some books and um, <laughs> one by a famous Democrat left-wing pollster called Celinda Lake. Was, she had a, a self-help guide to advocacy groups like yours. Uh, so I read that and then invented a little system, statistical system, uh, and a telephone system to to poll, and that uh, next election where I was the pollster and strategist was a, a big success. They were the gut then government was returned with a increased majority, and then I was then hired by other um, sort of political entities around uh, around uh, around Australia, and ended up working uh, for John Howard in 1986 as his his pollster, and then sort of got into the big leagues, I suppose you'd call it that way. But I never intended to 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 get into politics and indeed had no interest. I wasn't student activist. I wasn't in, in any clubs. So I was a reluctant appointee. Do you know, that's fascinating for a number of reasons. First of all, for the, the stats. And I remember um, as an economic student um, in, in high school learning about um, that study and the basket of goods and, and how, basket, you know, yeah. how, how, how do you identify what a basket is, you know, in terms mm. of, um, you can identify art purchases in the household expenditure survey. If you want to go into the detail, you can actually work out how much Australians spend on art, art supplies, um, in general. So, so I, I commend it to all your, all your participants. I am also scribbling a note about that, but I'm fascinated um, uh, by what you're saying about, you know, it having been accidental, like you hadn't been a, a political person. Um, last week, our guest was um, Nicholas Picard, who is Director of Public Affairs at APRA AMCOS, um, and he gave a very uh, similar s story, not in terms of the specifics of, of where you come from, but also never having been political, uh, got into it, you know, kind of indirectly, accidentally. Um, mm. And... Um, though uh, um, for you, it's it's very much that that focus on data and what data can can tell us. Data, data, and and human decision making processes. Mm. So it's the combination of of going deep and wide. So if you can imagine a T, a giant T. So the wide is is at the top of the T is is um, you know public opinion polling, you know numbers attached to either marginal seats in whatever country you're polling in. We we're worldwide, so we poll a number of countries. Um, but but you know how many, how what percentage of the population, or what percentage of women, or what percentage of the Indigenous Australians think of particular things? You know, constitutional recognition, the republic, the state of the economy, COVID response. So you attach numbers to satisfaction about things. 
so you know how many people are thinking um, certain things. But more importantly, to in terms of the art of persuasion, you have to understand how people think rather than what they think. And that way you can be predictive. So if you understand, you know, it's rather like understanding your friends. You can, you can, you can quote statistics about them to describe them to people, or you can tell others how that person tends to think, how they process information, what they find important, what's important in their lives beyond the issue you're speaking to them about at that moment. And so you get the contextual arguments and you also know their emotional states. That is, um, you know, what rules the, the decision-making process when they're making a decision about a product or about whether to support your community or whether to support a certain uh, political party or not. Um, you know, what dominates, what, what other um, emotional factors uh, dominate? And there's, there are about 25, for example, there are about 25 emotional states that dominate decision-making in the public domain, sense mm. of self-esteem, a sense of national pride, concern for future generations, which is tremendously important, for example, on the environment, a sense of excitement, a sense of personal fulfilment. All these things drive decision-making ultimately, and it's to those values um, that, they, that, that, that we try and understand how people are oriented before we understand how they're thinking about a particular issue. Um, and that's really the difference between internal, you know, and private pollsters. We un we're more mass psychologists than we are number counters. You know, we're very accurate. I think at the last election, our numbers were plus or minus 0 0.1 off or something like that. And, and they're generally not, not very far off. We tend to use much more advanced techniques than what the polls you see in the public are. We tend to do more mm. sample. We tend to to sample more frequently. We tend to be more accurate in terms of election prediction outcomes because we sample marginal seats rather than the whole nation. Um, and we do mixed modal. So, um, for example, we uh, we would, you know, depending on the audience, either go online. Sometimes we use landlines if they're older Australians. Sometimes we use mobiles. So we're not so dependent on a particular methodology um, for the neatness of a describing it to a newspaper article. So. Um, you know, what, what we do is actually a lot different in terms of the polling part of the strategy because essentially each campaign is constructed in three ways. Um, there, there's two lots of threes that are important in campaigns. Um, the, the first is the structure of the campaign, which is before you make decisions about how you um, affect government decision-making, you've got to understand both the audience they're responsible to, that is the voters, because they'll always orient themselves to them. And that's important to do not only to understand what they're hearing back, but to also break down a few myths, because we live in a world not of perceptions, but of perceptions of perceptions. <laughs> so every night if you watch Sky After Dark or if you watch ABC The Drum, God help you if you listen to either, um, you might you might get a particular view of those people's views, of people's views. And, of course, that's a third-part derivative. That's a third-stage derivative. It's better to actually understand people because there's a lot of myths. So there's a lot of people telling you what people think, but there's not a lot of people measuring what people think, not, not deeply, um, apart from, you know, the odd published polls. There's not a lot of it. And so the first thing you'll find is that there's a lot of myth-making about public opinion. Oh, the art sector is unpopular or... It's irrelevant, or oh, they don't like this, or they don't, they do like this, or they support a republic, or they don't. Most of that is very superficial analysis, and it's very important when you're having conversations with political grown-ups that your your observations about Australian life and Australian thinking are more insightful than the people who would attack you, because you give them something in those insights um, to understand the nature of things. And so there's the research first, then there's formulated strategy. So if you're going to be in a fight, um, you know, or a battle or a, a program to influence politicians, 
write down your strategy first. Who, you know, who is the target audience? Uh, what are they thinking? On what basis are they making their decisions? Who is influential upon them? Um, uh, what else is going on in that decision maker's life is, that could be relevant to what we're doing? Financial, you know, career, other things. And then at what stage do we time all those things and what budget should be applied to each one of those stages? And then, of course, there's the, there's the results part, which is to what extent are we succeeding or not? That's the third part. And how do we just strategy? Um, and then the other three part, you know, trick to understanding how to influence and campaign is there's only ever three target audiences. Uh, the first is then they are swing, base, swing, and anti. Um, and you know, the, the, the virtually all campaigns are about reinforcing your base to either you know get funding or to get crucial resources or those base, uh, your base um, are the activists who go out into the community and talk to their neighbours and friends and people at, you know, the coffee shops and whatever. And then that they the interviews the swing group because, you know, ultimately you want to change opinions, you want to consolidate any support you have amongst the swing if it's, you know, if it's swingable or if they don't support you, you want to change their mind. And then you've got the antis who you might neutralise either through using your base to that so they take them on online, or um, uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, you know their 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 positions don't gain any momentum. Um, and but also in doing that, uh, you know, most of the time keep the swing in mind because a lot of campaigners get in this semi-defensive position and believe a campaign is only answering the worst of the accusation of your opponents and so it, and and then when that happens typically campaigns sound very very defensive and you fail to accentuate the positive which ultimately motivate people so um and you know in 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 your sector there are many positives and so for example if you went out today and say look you know when we're not all these things um uh, all you're doing is producing a catalogue of sins. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a piece on this um, because I've been heavily involved in, for example, the Indigenous space for a lot, very long period of time and working with a bunch of Indigenous leaders now on constitutional recognition that you may have read about um, in various newspapers recently. Um, but, you know, one of the things uh, that is true, for example, about... Um, uh, you know about the indigenous community and and the marvelous contribution they make to Australian culture and life is that too often the media portrays them through a, cat a catalog of 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 bad stories rather than a representation of the amazing diversity of their contributions in you know in law in art uh, in science um, and in a range of areas and uh, and, you know, it's more than a catalogue of woes. And that's a good example of how you shouldn't just address your negative. You should find something positive to say. And it's generally the research that does that. And then, of course, uh, you know, how you present these arguments through the construction of a narrative, how you time them with politicians is then some tricks of the trade in there. For, one is, for example, just, just as a conversation starter, you know, everyone loves to go to Canberra. And if, you know, politics is Hollywood for other for ugly people, that's where all the ugly people go. And usually it's a vanity trip. They like to go to Canberra, they get seen at Aussies, you know, they go home to their wives uh, or husbands or boyfriends or girlfriends and say, I told the minister this and I was very important. And they strut around like maniacs and they look foolish. The best way to see a minister often is to see them outside of Canberra when they've got a bit more time and they're not having divisions every five seconds and they're more concentrated and they can think more deeply about your issues and in which you can bring your local representation as well. I'm so glad um, you said that. To, to, to no, I just hate it. It's something God, that, I've yeah, been there for yeah, years. I avoid yeah, the place like yeah. the plague. This has been this has something been that a lot of our speakers lot of our have speakers. really emphasised over these weeks, that not just to escape 
that uh, that busyness in Canberra, but also, of course, that we need to be able to engage with politicians locally in their electorates. It's where they're most motivated. That's where they're most passionately interested. They, they want to get to know. Um, they want to be invited to to openings to studios and so on. So yeah, I'm I'm really glad that that, that you. Well, you think that. about not the visual arts, but you think of the performing arts. I know there's an overlap in your in your group of industries, you know, because there are some visual performed arts, I suppose. But, um, you know, in, in, the, in the performing arts, for example, you know, the, when, when often when the, the performing arts want to talk about their contribution to the, the economy, they get the big wigs out, the big names, you know, the big stars, the big execs, the big studio people out. Um, but, you know, they're just the equivalent of a bank lobbying with a bank CEO and not the branch manager who's trusted. Uh, they're the equivalent of a mining CEO going to Canberra and not um, and not mm. not Wendy, the the lab scientist who works on all content, um, who's much more interesting and much more engaging and much more local, and much more real. And I know when we were involved in the mining industry campaign against the Kevin Rudd's mining industry tax, uh, which we were the strategists and pollsters on, um, one of the things we did was to make sure that you know mine workers and people on the front line were the representatives in Canberra and the offices, not, you know, blokes in suits um, because, they're one, they're boring, uh, and, two, they don't tell, you know, stories in the right way. And if you talk about, the say, the performing arts rather than the visual art, but, you know, they, they have a, in terms of the contribution, you'd be better off, um, you know, bringing to Canberra or a local office uh, the the woman who runs a logistic service in support of uh, performing arts, or uh, you know a transportation company whose sixty percent of whose business comes from uh, performance art, and they go to the local members often say, "Hey, twenty people are dependent on this on this community." To make that hyper local. Mm. is tremendously important because it's real. There's not the cynicism. Oh, yeah. Or people in visual arts touring, people in regional galleries that you and I have spoken about before, telling that important regional story. I think that is Every critical. country town has a yeah. gallery. Yep. And not only does every country town has a gallery, the gallery is tip top number one in all the local literature talking about the town. The Crookwell, you know, my my nearest, um, you know, the, the local galleries and the local arts and slash crafts shops are tremendously important as are the art festivals yeah and yeah. you know you find in those country areas a lot of people who've retru retreated from the city to concentrate on on their art and their and their and their passion um and you know it's always best to harness that because it just overcomes that terrible thing which is so prevalent in modern campaigning which is cynicism yeah yeah now, Mark, you have just presented so much, which we're going to drill into because I know everyone's going to have lots of questions and I've got super duper lots of questions. Let's go back to towards the beginning when you were describing the difference between um, the detailed forensic and psychological work that you do and the more superficial work of polling that tends to be reported. So something that has been discussed um, um, by the media in Australia for probably the last 10 years, uh, and but more so in the last five years, is that um, polling um, has become less and less reliable, that this, this notion that, um, you know, the same 1,200 people are at home on a weeknight to answer their landline and, and, and answer two or three very basic questions um, um, and then, uh, you know, being very surprised when the outcome is not what the, the polls predicted. But then, of course, there's that issue where um, uh, those polling um, a, a lot of those um, more superficial phone polls are owned by the newspaper who is doing the reporting of them. And so there's that thing of, okay, perhaps questions are being asked that are going to achieve headlines, whereas your work, um, you have a, a deep long-term relationship with the party that you're working with. Um, you're looking at, as you say, the things that motivate people to think differently. What's the, what's the difference between, uh, specifically even going into maybe some of the questions that are asked, the difference between the, the polling that you do to understand public sentiment and some of that more superficial polling? Yeah, well, you know, you can read a poll 
uh, for example, in the newspapers. And for what they do, they're fine. And, you know, there's budgetary issues these days. But they'll tell you nothing about, if you were a stranger, it would tell you nothing about the way Australians think. That's the reality. Um, that's the simplest way I can explain it. You can read a number. It's like saying, look, you know, describing a local street. This, this is what published polling does. It describes your local street by saying there's 13 houses in that street, there's 2.5, um, you know, um, you know, uh, people per household in that street. It's medium income. Uh, they tend to buy Mazdas and uh, they tend to be 60% Liberal voters. You actually know nothing about the people in that street, right? Nothing. So you, you might, you might, you, you don't know about the dynamics of that street. You don't know about the friendships. You don't know the basis on which those people make decisions or what's important to them. You know nothing unless you actually go to that street and you speak to them and have a long conversation. So generally in sophisticated modern party political and corporate research, there's really three phases. There's a sort of exploratory phase, which is to understand people's motivations. You know, what, what is core to them at the moment? What is the con context? What are you trying to capture? Uh, the context might be deep uneasy about the state of the world, a, a desire and a passion to have a better world, uh, a need to be recognised, a desire to, for more security in their lives, financial or otherwise, all these things. In fact, I, I've got a favourite saying, which is, you know, there's no such thing as family values, only things that are valued by family, love, a sense of self-esteem, a sense of enlightenment, empowerment that comes from good parenting and, and, and so forth. Um, and those are the things that drive behaviour. So what we try and do is we run depth interviews and focus groups, um, which are collections of 10 people, less so, more triads these days, which is small groups, three and four. So we understand what's going on in their lives. You know, if you, any good doctor, um, for example, won't sit there and measure heartbeat, they'll, they'll try and understand what's been going on in your life like, lately to lead you to getting sick. Um, they'll have to understand your life and your lifestyle in order to say, hey, looks like you've been on the source too much or you haven't been doing enough exercise, you haven't been out in the sun, all those sorts of things. They have to understand you in order to understand the statistics of your heartbeat and everything else. That's the best analogy I can give. So you actually have to sit down and listen to people. Um, and then once we do that and we explore their lives, we then sort of un try and get an understand of, of really five things, okay? And they, they get to the heart of all opinion. The first is awareness of an issue that you, you're trying to get to. Is it part of their lives or not? Do they, un do they have they even heard of this thing? And then uh, understanding. So they may have heard of something, or they may have not have heard of something, but when you prompt them with it, they will have certain understandings or misunderstandings. So um, I often say, you know, I hate that word educate. Now, I'd rather make people understand than educate because you can tell people stuff, but do they really understand it? Have they processed it in the, in the way that is relevant and good? Um, so there's awareness, understanding, and then there's um, uh, uh, um, importance to self. So they might be aware of something. They might completely understand what you're saying at a rational level, and that, but they're just not important to their lives. It's just like emotionally unattached they just go yeah that's terrible pass the beer nuts right no emotional engagement and therefore no motivation or well, there and but there's ways to get it emotionally motivated and we we look at that like what other things in their lives that we can link to that that it's important and then the next thing is so awareness understanding personal relevance personal emotional relevance and then differentiation that is you're always in competition. Even if you don't have direct competition, and I'm certain the art sector doesn't, apart from a few mad ring, might right wingers, um, but but you do have competition in terms of attention. Um, so we try and understand the competitive forces. So what is leading people not to listen to you? What are the alternative arguments? And then we test the alternative arguments to the alternative arguments. So what are your arguments to their arguments? We tease those out. Um, and uh, so that's awareness, understanding, importance to self emotionally, the differentiation, what you're good at versus what they're good at. What are your equities 
What will they believe you in respect to your issues above all others, including the government? So what's your strongest point? So competitive equity, so that's differentiation. The last thing is execution. So they can understand something, they can they can be aware of something, they can understand it. Secondly, thirdly, they can be emotionally engaged. Fourthly, they can understand that you have certain strengths. But fifthly, the language might be completely inappropriate. They might, you, you just might be talking gobbledygook, right? It's just, this is rather like the, the problem with a house. You know, you built the house, it's it's perfect, but you just painted it the wrong colour. If you change the colour, it'd be fine. So there's that in, there's that, that last bit, which is everyone sort of gets into in politics, which is the wordsmithing and all that stuff. But really that comes last. You, you know, unless you get the structure of the house right, if, if wordsmithing is painting, it doesn't matter what you paint it, if the structure's wrong, if it doesn't accommodate the needs of the individual. So that's what we tend to look at. And um, particularly with the last part, the, the sort of competitive parts that we use very advanced quantitative techniques, that is deep polling, and that involves, you know, tens of thousands of samples in marginal seats or swing areas, or if it's a com commercial issue with, with swing consumers, and then we run very sophisticated regression analysis where we actually quantitatively test the arguments and we see not which arguments people agree with. That's not what we're actually interested in. We, under, we, we, we test which arguments have greatest bending power. So in motorsport, they call this torque. What has the greatest twisting capacity to change opinions or to, if you're in front to consolidate opinions? And um, and we do that by by some quite sophisticated methodological techniques. So we're just completely different from published polling. I mean, we're just oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that, in that, fact, that be more different. It's not it's not yeah. hubris, but it's just habit. I you know in the in the eleven odd years I was John Howard poll, poll, John Howard's pollster and strategist. I never read a poll, never read a published poll. Once. You're better off you're without, without them. them. And certainly and a lot of journalists lot of advocate, advocate for not, not reporting them because, of course, it's so, it's so easy, easy to just, just write a story, write a story that says this, this number was this number. and this number was that without going into that detail. Let's let's go into the the, the, the final well, it just doesn't, tell, it just doesn't about, tell you much. Well, no, that's right. That's right. But it's very it's a very easy column to write if you're a journalist who's who's on a deadline. And so it's, yeah, it, it's a shame. Look, I think they are so, legitimate. They are yeah. legitimate in that you've got to have some sense of what's broadly been popular or not, but it's too, it's you know, there's not enough data often to make those conclusions and often the statistical shifts are so small, um, you know, a sample of a 1,000 yeah, you know, I really wish there was a practice. Yeah. I wish there was a best practice of always reporting the sample size when when things like that are reported because that that'd be a huge shift. The best Let's go standard back to the, what you were saying about that. language. Um, yep. Because uh, we are just over the halfway mark and still so yep. much to ask you. Um, let's go back to what you were just saying about language and kind of, you know, understanding that, getting that right, not wanting to educate but wanting to understand. And something that we've seen, um, I think one of the things that often plagues us in the arts is that perception that uh, the arts is elitist as opposed to something that everyone's involved in and engages with all the time. And we've noticed in the last little while that the Prime Minister's become um, quite direct directly engage with the package that was recently announced and uh, that event with uh, Guy Sebastian and others and really bringing out um, the arts workers who are in the background that people don't often get to see. So like you were saying, you know, who, who do you bring to that meeting? What's the story? What's what's the language that, that they're told? Um, and we've all been struck by the Prime Minister's use of that focus on tradies um, as a way of kind of connecting to um, a, a different or a broader group of people. Um, but then on the downside, um, you know, the um, people who work as tradies are actually in a whole different field to arts workers and arts workers are also trade professionals. Uh, but, you know, so but then that's a, that's a nuanced discussion that happens sort of within the arts. I think you'll find some of them are secret artists. You know? Oh well, exactly that too. A lot of a lot of producers, a lot of installers, and, yeah. and and so on. But tell us about 
Um, you know, over the years, we've talked about different ways of, um, you know, that um, um, arts policy in an unwritten way um, uh, becomes important to the coalition at different times. Um, and this has been a rare moment where we've had the Prime Minister directly engaged in an announcement and in, in responses, I guess, to the package and, and what it's meant and so on. How important was it to find a language, a vocabulary that the Prime Minister was going to be interested in and comfortable with, but also to, to engage um, with the general public that, that, that he prioritises and wants to reach? Well, well, I think there's two, there's two questions there, which is, you know, who, 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 who are you appealing there? And, I, mm. you know, my view about politics is that it, it's, um, it's a bit like a good curry um, <laughs> in, in that in that you have to have things in there that are, although they're uncomfortable um, or a bit new or a bit strange, sort of add to the mix of your narrative just to keep it fresh. And, um, you know, certainly that's one of the equities of, of, of the sort of arts thing, which is it's just, it's not so different, it's weird, but it's it's refreshing to see because you do have to refresh. You keep talking about the same stuff. People are going to turn off. And you do need to show, um, you know, a, a range of, of you, do, you do do need to show you're discriminating and discerning um, in relation to, to, to matters and you're not one tone. So, you know, even though the spicy eggplant in the Thai beef curry might be a bit sour, it actually adds something to them. Rather like when you have a McDonald's, you don't like to tick pickle and you take the pickle out it's pretty boring, um, even if you don't like the pickle. And, uh, you know, just remember that if you're non-conformist in terms of typical political strategy, which you might be in the arts, that there are other roles you can play. So you don't pretend to be, you know, uh, you know, some sort of group that would typically be of support to a government. But it doesn't mean that in terms of a narrative you can't add something in terms of newsworthiness, I mean, just getting a story up at the moment that's not about COVID is pretty hard. Yeah. And so, you know, if you talk about the economy, that's pretty hard as well because that's been done. Uh, you know, half of it's shut down. So when you when you talk about an arts announcement or getting some artists in, they're a little bit different. Um, you know, you celebrate what is your equity which is, you know, we're, we're not the usual suspects, but even then you can't make assumptions either about our view on life, our entrepreneurship. And, you know, the other thing, of course, about the arts industry, as everyone on the call knows, is that if any, if any group of people understands the large L liberal idea of making every buck go further, it's the arts industry, you know, because I, I've never seen a sort of rampant overspending artist in my life. Um, you know they're all they're all they're all pretty efficient with their money because they have to be because because it's precious and you know so there's all sorts of interesting and new bits that you can add to that narrative that would be of interest and appealing to a politician because it gives them something new to say you know there's that terrible phrase announceable uh, I'm not saying the that's why the prime minister did it but understand that there is a, a requirement to fill that void of content, you know, with something that's not rugby league scandal or, you know, geez, another business, another business is going over because of COVID. I mean, it's important, but we're kind of pretty much aware that we're all pretty rogered right now. So, um, you know, um, let's let's have something new and joyful. And I think uh, if not joyful, you know, at a different angle, I think, you know, that's that's a, that's 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 part mm. of it, the, the, the newsworthiness of the announcement. Yeah, yeah. Now that uh, links me but to... But also remember, from, that, um, remember that, my observation about the base, remember that, yes. you know, this is a misunderstood... So, so so this ridiculous cultural things that goes in the media about, you know, right-wing versus left-wing, remember a lot of the liberal donor base are people who love art. You know, they're yes. reasonably wealthy people. Uh, they've done well in life, even if they're not super rich, they've done well in life. And what do they do? They buy and consume art. They encourage their children to to be artists. They appreciate art um, in all its forms, generally, or you'll find it. We're talking the sort of you know much you know they're much maligned, but let, let's let's 
let's use the North Shore of Sydney as an example. You go to any home and, you know, there's a preponderance of art in there and there's certainly an appreciation of art. And and uh, so it's sort of cradle to grave stuff, you know, they're introduced with art when they're small. You know, when they're first starting their careers, they wish they had the money to buy some. And if they're not artists, they wish they were. And then um, later on in life, they enjoy it. And, um, yeah, you know, yeah, to, to yeah, try yeah. and use that to make it not just a consumer issue but also a political issue is is something that would be interesting to play with. Oh, well, I haven't really thought about it before. Uh, well, let's, let's think about it a bit now because if it's important to the base, if we've got voters who are, uh, if we've got people committed to uh, the party's principles who, who are donors, who are collectors, um, if, uh, it's, if it's absolutely a, a liberal value that, um, that artists are entrepreneurial or exceptionally good with money and resources and so on, then where is that gap, I guess, between... Um, uh, the fact that the arts does mean so much to so many people, um, but that, um, you know, it's not prioritised in terms of policy or uh, broader kinds of funding commitment, do you think? Is it about going back to that sense that, you know, the arts is, is perceived as um, elitist? Is it, if we go back to uh, the swing, the bass and the uh, ante, um, where, where do you think the art sits for um, a lot of the, the colleagues in the party? Well, I, I think as a as a political label, it's problematic. You know, they, they you know you used to used to have the Y in front of it. Remember in all the old cartoons, the arts community. Um, but um, you know, renewing that sort of what you know brand. I don't mean the, the physical brand. I mean the, the brand as an you know, identity in people's heads. That it's it's enriched again, you know, and, and it's not cliched that it's that wonderful diversity of people in community halls, you know, painting their terrible paintings um, or, you know, the MP knowing that there's a group of artists in, you know, in their areas. I mean, there, there's sort of areas outside of Adelaide where every single artist out there would be, you know, a secret closet liberal and, uh, you know, usually the, the better performing ones. But... But so there's a lot of interactions with those with those people, and so if you allow it to be the sort of cliche, it will be a cliche. And um, and I suppose their challenge is always to to make sure you have sufficient resources and contact to remind uh, decision makers that there's there's a quite a vibrant community and diverse, you know, in both mm. its views about issues and and in terms of its approach to life and in and in terms of its depth you know either in terms of local impact and sales or you know ancillary industries or supportive event industries you know the event industry most of the events industry would love more art shows and sales at the moment oh, so there's certainly would. Stuff to bring in and I my worry would be on your behalf that you know, that without sufficient mixing of kind of messages, sorry, without sufficient enrichment of messages that you, you yeah, you do become a cliche. And yeah, my yeah. answer to your dilemma is don't let yourself be one. Um, and, of course, you need sufficient risk. Always it's always right. difficult though, because, you know, we, we say in politics you can run you can run a bad campaign with money, but you can't run a good one without it. So you do have to have a, a, a minimum a minimal level of resources mm, mm. in order to, you know, properly bring those sorts of strategies to the fore. Absolutely. Now we've got a number of questions coming in from everyone. Um, first, just on that public perception issue, a question from Felicity Blake. Um, do Australians love art but hate artists, as in are artists considered wankers and dull bludgers, if you think about, uh, you know, anything that comes up in, uh, in, in public opinion? Is, is that an issue, do you think? Australians love art but hate artists? Oh, they'd probably hate a number of them. Um, but we all hate someone, don't we? Uh, I, I think give them sufficient diversity, give them someone to love, you know, um, you know, all, you know, all my, all my dad's friends were artists, um, you know, so, so I know a, a great number of artists. My, um, my, uh, my, 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 my male forebears were all 
um, sculpture artists, um, you know, so you sort of dig into anyone's family history, there's there's someone there, and I, I keep saying, you know, break through the stereotypes. So my answer would be maybe, um, but how are you going to change? My question to clients is always, that might be the case. It sounds like a bit of an issue. What are you going to do to change it? Yeah. And uh, so all we'll get armed with, you know, stories of three or four friends like you who, you know, are, are, are atypical or even if they are typical are not the stereotype and think about ways of exposure to, to get them in front of people. The media, even the local media is tremendously important. Remember, there's all these now local websites that have been create, created with the demise of um, digital doma, uh, uh, printed newspapers that are desperate for content. I mean, just desperate. So you can you can give them stories of, you know, eight struggling well-known local artists and that cumulative effect on the political psyche when MPs read their local uh, online local publication is something that will no doubt have an effect, positive effect in the future. So yeah, I don't, I don't think local. Mm. it's just, I think the more, the more likely though, it's a good question is that they switch off when they see a stereotype and that's not, having a go at the arts community. It's just they do the same with anyone. They switch off politicians when they see a political stereotype. They um, they switch off a football player when he goes, yeah, nah, yeah, nah. I mean, they switch off. But they listen when there's a slightly different sounding person, um, you know, with, with, with a bit of cognitive diversity uh, rather than, rather than, rather than geodemographic diversity. That makes a lot of sense. Let's go to another question just by Shelley Hinton there. You mentioned about uh, marginal seat polling earlier and Shelley asks, if mainly marginal seats are polled, how is that truly representative of the broader and specifically the arts community if your questions are arts focused? I think that's possibly bringing two different things together. Uh, well, if for example, um, you were having a lobbying campaign in order to somehow get concessions or extra funding to the arts community, any part of it, just called the broader arts community, not just the visual arts. Um, yeah, where where a, num a number of things would typically occur there. You'd, you know, sometimes you do polls for lobbying, in other words, to break down a myth. So, for example, if you were concerned, and it mightn't be a concern that, you know, there was a myth that everyone hated artists and you did a poll and they said, no, the arts community is local, is very important to me. Then you do a national representative poll, you know, to show a, a group of decision makers that the art community is not unpopular. It's very defensive, but you might want to do that on occasion. Um, whereas a marginal seat poll would be there uh, to show the sort of political campaigning class that that's also true in the swing areas. So it's not just coming from left-leaning white Labor seats and blue ribbon seats who all love the arts. It's actually the middle ground, which tends to be represented by marginal seats. But if you, but technically the answer is, if you take a broader range of marginal seats, it's pretty indicative of national opinion. Like probably 19 times out of 20, a broad range of marginal seats, say plus or minus 5% on the Macarra's pendulum. As I said, t actually... 19.9 .9 times out of 20 would be generally indicative of of non-marginal seat, um, you know, Australia-wide opinion if you were taking it in Australia. bit different in some other countries. You know, constituencies, swing constituencies in the UK, there's more of a sort of quite specific London-UK divide there. You know, London's one country and the rest of the UK is another country, as your London people would be aware. And that was shown in the Brexit vote, vote where basically London was Remain and everywhere else was not um, in the Brexit vote. So it depends on, on the country. But in Australia, marginal seat polling, I would say, is almost always indicative of the national trend. And, of course, marginal seats are, um, you were saying earlier about um, needing to uh, resource your campaigns, needing to actually have good money um, to take things seriously. Political parties are, of course, also 
in the same boat, constantly fundraising uh, and needing to think about where to spend their resources and marginal seats, of course, uh, when you're looking at, the, at that pendulum, you know that there are seats that, uh, you know, at the margin is just so massive that you're probably going to spend less resources. They're not, they're not, they're, they don't spend money on safe seats. I mean, that's yeah. the, they really only, political parties around the world really only, you know, s spend money on safe, on, on swing constituencies be it you know call them seats constituencies in the uk ridings and ridings in the you know in, um, in 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 canada districts in the uk you know in the us you have to remember all these terms when you do these things <laughs> um, but 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 yes it it um yeah the the, the you know, 80 percent of the resources go into 20 percent of the seats it's the 80 20 rule basically and it takes us back to what you said at the beginning, that um, your work isn't so much about just uh, understanding um, what people think, but it's about what influences decision making. And so uh, when you're looking at that, um, um, at the swing, you're looking at people who are in a position where they're going to make a decision heading into the election as opposed to being a rusted on voter on either end. And similarly, uh, you're, you're also supporting decision making for politicians um, yeah. so that they're guiding so you it's that uh, that complexity of knowing what to ask knowing where to ask it and then um, that other end how depending, you, on, depending on what the blockage is yes yeah. so yeah if, if it's genuinely open field you know we can shape the environment then you do a, a bigger thoughtful piece sometimes it's tactical where you're just trying to get rid of a few myths in order to open the door Sometimes you 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 know if, if if you know and remember polling's only one part of the campaign, um, uh, you know and and you know w w what I say about campaigning is look, you know a PR person will always recommend a bit of PR. A lawyer will always want to sue someone. A digital person will always want to do digital ads on Facebook. Um, you know a direct mail person will just want to send pamphlets out. Um, you know, a grassroots campaigner will just want to march in the streets with placards and, and performance art. Um, but a campaign's about which one of those resources works best with the target audience. Um, and and you have to be what we call platform independent, um, depending on what the research shows and what also is tactically available. You know, what what is what gives you the best bang for your buck for for motivating your base and for and for you know persuading those swing audiences, um, even if they're elite audiences, even if they're you know just in Canberra, it's, it's still the same analysis. What what will what technique will work best with them? And it's always there's never a blanket rule for that. I mean, there's some tricks of the trade like don't visit them in Canberra all the time, all all that stuff we talked about. Um, but generally, it's a you know you got to think about your audience um, and you know, what particular uh, pressures they're under at that time and then yeah. basically customise. And that's just a lot of work and 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 uh, and, and and footwork and, and, and thinking, um, which is the most important thing. You know, just, just be thoughtful. Um, it's, you know, the, 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 the stereotype of lobbying is that it's brutal and everything else, but the generally successful campaigns are nuanced. I mean, they're very brutal in their simplicity and the power of their message and you've but been very good at that over the years some very simple stop the boats and all that stuff yeah the boats but, and the ways. But, but um but i think you know i think with the arts community the 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 the, the you know trying to find a new side of the of the of you know of the creative space you know, in an expressing it a new way because you know people get bored and they, they want to hear new things and they, it's human nature so don't be boring and a lot of the things that you know a particular market segment or grouping thinks are interesting to them are not interesting but there may be something that you're doing that you might think is not interesting but is tremendously in interesting to them like even Having numbers when you go visit about the number of artists, the number of art schools, the number of art activities, the number of art shows in the area. I mean, there should be a compendium of that for every single marginal seat. Oh, yeah. art, We're going to talk about that in our little in our workshop session after this. Now, um, unsurprisingly, Mark, our 
hour has completely flown by. We've got just a couple of minutes left. And so I will ask you one last question from the group, which comes from Kaz Willis. And she says, Tex, what is one thing you've learned about campaigning that is crucial or that surprised you really from left of field? One of those just unexpected things that someone said or did that just shifted your whole approach to something? Um, I would say it's a very good question. Uh, I would say at a personal level, and I've written a column on this about, it's called Pick Up the Phone, um, that I'm constantly surprised about how we imagine walls that don't exist. Walls, did you say? Walls, yeah. And I often say to people now, oh, you know, so-and-so won't support us, and I just say, pick up the phone, call them, ask them for help, and you'd be surprised what happens. And, you know, uh, I got in involved in the Indigenous space, you know, 15 or so years ago. Oh, it's more than that. It's, I'm getting old. It must be 20. Because a senior... Indigenous leader rang me up and said, Tex, you seem to have been on the other side of this. Can we have a chat to you? I said, that'd be great. I've been waiting for this. I've been too afraid to ask to help you. And bang, a marvellous relationship was developed because someone bothered to pick up the phone. should have been me, but it was this particular uh, leader. It was Pat Dodson, actually. Um, and, you know, so, so it's a good question. I would say that what surprised me is... is that the trick of bad people in politics is the manufacturing of division that simply doesn't exist. Mm. Um, and then they create this myth that something's unpopular or popular. That's been the constant surprise me. And at the moment, for example, a little plug, you know, you're talking about 60% plus support for constitutional recognition, no matter how you frame the question, right? So it's not sensitive to the wording. And yet a lot in the commentary it say, oh, you know, it's very controversial. It's no, no it's brainer. Not. It's not. Re Republic, not so much. Republic would crash and burn if you did it right now. But Conrec, i got to say, if you had a referendum now, it would be, you know, a couple of, one or two states might be dodgy, not even one, maybe one at most, but it would get up. But... You see, people have to, the elites themselves have to invent this thing. And so I think the, the worst thing any of us can do is to believe and hold ourselves back from getting up, you know, to, from getting on the phone and calling someone you wouldn't normally call. I do it all the time now as a result of that thing of what happened to me. And just I call someone who's allegedly supposed to be against something and I say, hey, mate, can we talk about this? And they usually say, yeah, why not? Thanks for asking. I mean, that's, that's been the most surprising thing to me. And he goes, what was I imagining? Oh, I thought this person was terrible. Um, I'm so I glad even, that you even mentioned it. talk to me. So, you know, the, the, the world's a surprising place. <laughs> even who did you say? Even you talk to me. So, you know. Even me. <laughs> I should say to everyone, uh, Tex and I met more than 15 years ago when uh, we had offices just one floor from one another and um, uh, and then got talking about a range of things and our, our paths have kept crossing and being able to just call or text you. Um, well, when it must I, have been 60, I, was, I, I was about to go off and help Boris for his first election yeah. as mayor, if you recall. Yeah. yeah, it was, yep, before Boris. It was yep. some time ago now. Free Boris. Uh, and to, yeah, be able to have that, that sounding board has been incredibly important for me. But you've just touched on something that is so important for all of us, which is, you know, getting on the phone and having the conversation, speaking also, you know, to your local MP, to other candidates. They want to hear from you. And in a country with, you know, a fairly small population compared to the rest of the world and a very concentrated media ownership, those divisions are often a lot more stark than we actually think they are. So huge thanks, uh, Mark, for setting that out in such a detailed way. I think we're all going to be talking a great deal now about the whole psychology of what you do, but it's great of you 
you to spend an hour with us today and Always everyone in that awkward way that we do online with the chat uh please do the the text-based equivalent of thanking Mark with claps and thanks. And in a little minute, uh, Tex is going to hit the button and, and say bye. But, yeah, thanks thanks so much. Really great Pleasure. chat. All the best with your uh, workshop. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Oh, that, and, and lots of questions that are now still coming in um, for Mark. We'll see how many of those I can sort of, you know, pass on to him in in, in some other way. But um, and I know that um, a lot of you have asked a lot of really great questions that we just didn't get to. Um, if, we, if we compare Nicholas uh, last week to text this week, um, we have, you know, more the kind of um, short, sharp answers opposed to uh, those really long, detailed answers. I, I'm, I've got to go back now. Thankfully, we record and transcribe these because because there are a couple of those longer answers where text set out uh, basically a whole uh, campaign infrastructure um, in ways that are just enormously helpful in terms of the key terms around that strategy. And as we were discussing, you know, over the weeks, it's so important that we hear from Labor and Liberal and Greens politicians and strategists and um, and and others. So, um, yeah, really, really interesting to have all of that. Now, before we go into the um, workshop aspect um, of our session today, where we'll look at some political engagement based on what Tex has said, but also uh, based on the our updated um, kit, which is now on uh, on the website. And again, these sessions are free for everyone. The kit. The advocacy kit that goes with the sessions are available for NAVA members only, so we don't get in big, big trouble and not focusing, uh, of course, on our membership. As you know, as I've said many times, NAVA membership starts from just $7.50 a month, uh, which is cheaper than two coffees, you know, one for you and one for me. Um, and of course, as you know, I don't drink coffee, so that's just saved you even more money right there. Now, I'm just going to scroll back and see which questions I've missed from everyone to see whether uh, we can pick them up now. And I'm sorry, uh, a few of us are saying that the connection is not great today, um, although for some of us, the audio is fine. Um, so yes, apologies that the internet gods are smiling on me today and apparently not for many of us. Yvonne East, um, it's talking about living on the North Shore of Sydney, I'm assuming, um, and it'd be great to see some of her neighbours have a deeper investment into the art that, that, that they purchase. Um, so talking about ideas to develop the emotional, intellectual importance to self. Yeah, oh, that's, um, there are so many um, different kinds of critique and appreciation resources um, online, but I would say, Yvonne, just have have a chat like if they're your literal neighbors ask them what they invest in ask them what their emotional response is you know that conversation itself i think is a really important advocacy um scrolling down some more um yes and accordingly saying that um yeah we haven't had um um politicians who choose the arts as something they want to focus their advocacy on Keating, of course, being, um, you know, the, the, the last in that very prominent way as Prime Minister. Um, I think it has been quite important for, for Tony Burke. Um, the arts were very important to George Brandis. Uh, the particular arts that, that Senator Brandis enjoyed were very important to him. And so I think that was also... Um, uh, you know, frustratingly, ironically, in terms of the damage that, that he did, he was, of course, um, a, a absolutely passionate um, about the arts. Um, now, just scrolling down to see if I've missed any more questions. Uh, Alex is asking about the, the three of the five um, campaign stages in terms of um, campaign preparation and... Um, what is it in Australia's arts and cults that many people have an emotional resonance with? Um, yeah, I think he'd probably touch on that in a few different places, but that would be a great discussion um, to draw out as well. Uh, and thank you to Penelope for posting the link to membership. Um, and Kaz points out also that asking questions, as Tech says, has always been a good connector uh, and for Kaz in the corporate world. Yeah, I think we're just... Oh, 
often just, yeah, reluctant to get on the phone and ask the question. Um, some of my most reliable and, um, uh, you know, still to this day relationships with MPs um, who are Liberals and Nationals um, has been either I've rung them or they've rung me. Um, and, um, you know, it started as, you know, either one of us saying, look, I think you're going to disagree with this, but just hear me out. And then by the end of the conversation, we're in furious agreement and we're trying to work out how to um, bring others in the party on board. Now, I am going to uh, turn on the um, switch to the presentation mode um, and go to our updated um, handbook number four, Understanding the Politics. So please tell me if you're now seeing that on your screen. Um, and thank you to Penelope for posting uh, the link there to free subscription and also to membership. Um, so hopefully you're now seeing the cover page for uh, part four of the Advocacy Workshops uh, Handbook. Um, I will just wait to hear someone say that they can see that um, because sometimes there's been a bit of a delay. Oh, yes, you can. Okay, wonderful. So the story from, uh, from here. Um, I just pressed the wrong button. There we go. Um, this program, um, of course, has been um, our online version of something that we did in Canberra last year um, to support a range of advocates to develop skills together. And this year, for all the obvious reasons, um, it's online so that we can develop skills together, not just in a one-off way, not just when something terrible happens, but in a way that lasts so that in one another, we're nurturing a real commitment long-term um, to the kind of ongoing advocacy that keeps making the arts an issue for decision makers. Um, we started out um, looking at what's the state of the arts right now? What are some of the key issues? Um, and these have certainly become exacerbated um, throughout this year around issues of uh, declining incomes, um, challenges in professional practice, upholding of standards. Um, and then we talked about advocacy as being something that uh, presents your vision in a compelling way, in the way that, that, that you would. And then if we look now at this structure, um, this one in particular here from um, uh, the American strategist Bill Moyer, and we look at um, these different focuses um, for a campaign focusing on citizens, on reformers, on rebels, on change agents, and then the way that we um, focus in on this um, from the NAVA point of view, um, this does very much align with a lot of what Mark was just saying. Um, there's, um, and no doubt this touches on some of the questions that were asked, but what can you, what can you see now in um, some of what uh, Tex was just talking about and this need to look at a particular focus at segments, at the kinds of language that is used. Um, who can remember an example of something that, um, that the text was just describing? You know, the difference between having to engage with policymakers, the, the, the challenges of um, reaching the media in particular ways, the segmenting of the public, um, and the, you know, the, 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 the challenge of focusing a message in a way that is really going to reach you know, who you need for it to reach. It's enormously challenging, especially when we're uh, tight on resources. Um, but important to look at the specific aspects of what we can achieve both as individuals and as a group. We then looked at how we nurture local advocacy. Um, we um, looked at some of the specifics of a strategy, and this also goes into a lot of what Mark was just saying around the tools that we have at hand, the language that we use, particularly around emotion, 
Um, and I'm, again, particularly delighted that um, uh, Mark was emphasising having the local meetings, the local conversation, that story that is uniquely yours, that doesn't pander to any kind of cliché. Um, we talked about... Um, oh, yes, there it is, the very brief history of arts policy that, that we touched on last week, um, which, uh, yes, still delights me as a very useful tool when I, when I look back on it. Uh, it's been very popular. Um, the sense of an arts policy that is not written, but is still something that is in effect. Um, and then um, through our chapter on policy, um, and then going into the media. And now I'm going to skip ahead to the questions that we look at today, which are how do we engage with government? So our next week, uh, our guest next week is Helen O'Neill, uh, who's also been a political advisor, uh, but she's also been the head of numerous um, peak bodies in the arts. Um, and we're gonna go into the specifics of how do you plan a meeting with an MP, and then we're going to look at some social media engagement as well. Um, but um, let's have a look now at some of the structures that kind of underlie how we're going to engage with MPs, and then we'll talk a bit about our plans for Arts Day on the Hill. And thank you to Penelope for just posting the link there to the Arts Day on the Hill event that is coming up on the 12th of August and that we are hoping that all of you will register for as advocates and that some of you might want to register for as media spokespeople as well. So although Parliament seems and is big and complex, um, we can kind of, and you know, and here's Parliament House just to show us exactly how big and complex it is, um, there are um, a range of ways that any uh, parliamentary democracy goes out of its way to invite people to engage because they have to, that's the basis of, of, of democracy. There are government inquiries that we can submit to. Uh, there are parliamentary committees. There's obviously voting. Uh, there's engagement through the media. There's, you know, relationships to nurture really, really long term. Um, now, I'm just noticing in the chat there, um, Gabrielle Sullivan has said, well, if the politicians will not be in Canberra, having deferred the August session, will the Arts Down the Hill date be changed? And no, it won't. Um, and so we won't actually be... Um, on that hill, which is very frustrating. Uh, but what we will do is intensify an online engagement where we're going to connect and engage in a range of um, both um, uh, focused social media conversations with MPs that you will all be doing, uh, but we will still also be requesting meetings um, at the electorate level. And so it'll be very similar, it's just that they will not be in Canberra. It's really frustrating. The um, until the Prime Minister's announcement that those weeks uh, were going to be suspended, you'll be looking at this week to week going, OK, well, how are we going to do this this year? Because our aim is to achieve a critical mass of advocacy and to have that response um, among our community in the media and also with politicians. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking, OK, well, obviously, the world's taken a big sickie. So uh, we're gonna do a whole lot of stuff online and then look, you know, I'll probably go to Canberra and, uh, you know, do some kind of uh, you know, a series of meetings and a focus for us. Then of course, the premier of my state, Daniel Andrews locked us down. So that made that impossible for me. And then the prime minister canceled uh, those sittings. So there is no prospect of any of us um, actually going to parliament house on these days. But of course, parliament house, is, um, and that notion of the hill, uh, Capitol Hill, um, is really just the physical manifestation of a set of structures and decision-making modes and uh, democratic engagements um, that do take place there, but also take place all over Australia. And so that's what we're going to be harnessing. Um, when we look at um, the development of relationships with MPs, um, it's so important that we harness 
um, that we develop an ongoing set of conversations. Um, and, you know, we've talked in the past about how like, if we run an organisation or if you're an artist who um, really prioritises building relationships with collectors, you spend a lot of time focusing on those people, on partners and donors and sponsors and so on. But for some reason, we don't treat individual politicians in that way. We don't prioritise the building of those direct relationships. Now, last week I asked who has had that opportunity, particularly since, you know, if lockdowns have ended in your state, um, who has had that opportunity to, to get in touch with an MP since this time to introduce yourself, to tag them um, on a social media post, um, really keen to know in the chat um, um, what kinds of homework people have been doing in the intervening weeks. Because again, it's just so important that politicians are hearing about the arts from people in their electorate or state um, to hear about uh, to hear about what is specifically going on. Um, they need, uh, particularly arts ministers, need our active support and engagement so that when they go and speak to front benches, that conversation is already good and fresh. Kaz Willis is saying, how about every artist put a piece in their front windows or yards? That way every artist could participate. Now, if we do that, then our audience, if we put something in our window or in our yard, then our audience is the people who happen to be passing by our front window or our yard. So how can we go that next level and all of us do a small thing that can have a big impact? Um, where would we put um, that work, that idea? Would we use social media? Would we use the local media? And very glad again that Tex was saying how important it is to engage with local media, especially um, regionally and in that suburban way. So good idea, Kaz, and how do we take it to that next level? How do we all reach a large number of small audiences um, in ways that are going to achieve a critical mass on that day? So how do we change that? Again, nurturing those local conversations that keep you in the regular habit of talking about your practice and connecting your practice to current issues so that you're then ready to meet with an MP. And next week, our, our session is going to be about how, how do you do a meeting with an MP. Um, if you're already practiced in having those conversations, it's just you know, it's so much easier, that advocacy flows so much more. Um, and it's something that, oh, I forget who was saying it at the end of our chat last week, saying that, oh, you know, is it a matter of building up that confidence to get on the phone with an MP or send them an email or tagging them into, into social media? So we're all going to build that confidence for each other. Another way of doing that is to form a local group of trusted confidants and connect one another with editors, radio producers, advisors, politicians, business leaders and influential thinkers. So who can you share your great networks with and who should they be hearing from? So, for example, among our group today, there'll be some of you who've got good relationships with the editors of your local paper. There'll be others who've got a good relationship with someone who is, you know, really best mates with the local MP. How can you swap and exchange and share those networks and make those introductions so that the editor is hearing from that other person, or so that that influential person is hearing from that artist? How do we develop and, and, and spread that? And of course, yes, always inviting politicians to, to come and speak is, is, is hugely important. Um, we'll talk about, I think we talked about the parliamentary friendship group in previous weeks. Um, this now goes to something that um, Mark Texter said earlier, um, and that was about having statistics ready to hand about your electorate or the electorate of the MP that you're about to meet with or uh, engage in a social media discussion with. Um, I hope everyone knows about the Australia Council electorate profiles. Has anyone used it before? I know we've talked about it probably earlier on um, in the first weeks of our workshops. Has anyone been using um, the Australia Council electorate profiles? Um, 
and if so, tell me, give us an example of, of what you've done with it. And, and someone who can Google without being distracted, um, send us the link, post the link to the Australian Council electoral uh, profiles as well. So when this first came out a couple of years ago, I described it as one of the most radical things that the Australia Council had ever done, and I'm enormously grateful for it. So for government reporting reasons, the Australia Council have to um, report to government on the spread of electorates um, where their grants are distributed so that, you know, for all the kind of sports rorts type reasons that we're seeing now, um, so that senior public servants can say with confidence that um, there is no skewing uh, in terms of where those grants end up. So it occurred to someone at the Australia Council that, mm, wait a minute, we're collecting all this data. We could actually make this available for everyone so that you can just go to the website and select an electorate from the drop down thing. And then it gives you, oh, and thanks Penelope for posting the link. Um, it gives you a world of information specifically for that electorate. So what's the arts participation rate? What are some audience numbers? What about box office? What about numbers of cinemas and things? What are some, you know, key institutions and so on? Um, and so there's arts participation, there's creative and cultural employment and businesses. Uh, it does compare sports as well. There's like a little table on ticket buying, uh, ticket buying just for the arts, just for sport, and then together. Um, and so it's, yeah, it is super duper useful and the Australia Council are going to keep adding to this as they go. Uh, Cause it's just, yeah, it's enormously useful. Um, and intriguingly, um, it's also something that has been enormously useful for a lot of MPs that I've met with. Cause I'll say, oh, you know, I looked up on electoral profiles before I came to see you and I found out blah, blah, blah. And they say, oh, ooh, what's that? What's that? Um, and I will pull out my phone and show them. And they just rub their hands together in delight because they say, oh, well, I'm about to go and meet with, you know, the member for whatever. Um, I'm now going to look this up and I'll be able to say to her, um, did you know in your electorate, this is um, how people engage and connect with the arts. Uh, so thank you, Australia Council. Uh, I don't know if there's any of you on the line tonight, uh, but yeah, this is enormously useful. So enormously useful. And accordingly is saying she has thrown the Australia Council page to her VCA final year design students for they are a generation of practitioners who may well need to advocate like never before. Sadly true. Uh, and in fact, I'm giving a talk at the VCA, I think it's uh, tomorrow week on these kinds of issues precisely. But yeah, it is an incredibly useful tool. Now, Arts Day on the Hill is the 12th of August. Oh, thanks to Adam Simmons, who's just also posted the Australia Council Pattern Makers Audience Outlook Monitor was just updated yesterday. Some of you will have received surveys for this, and this is incredibly useful. It's crucial actually right now, because it's all about um, what's our readiness, not just us, but you know, the broader general public, what is our readiness and our risk appetite to go back into galleries, into theatres, into spaces small and large so that it can be used for planning uh, by artists and organisations and also for government and also feed into um, the kind of protocols that organisations are using for keeping people safe. Uh, some really interesting insights there. Thanks, Adam, for posting that. Um, so Art Down the Hill is Wednesday the 12th of August. And I'm just gonna see whether I can also share my screen um, and go to that page. Let me see if that will be possible. Um, Cause I know you can just put on the link, but it's kind of not quite the same. There is the screen sharing button. Um, uh, it wants me to open an app. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so um, let's see if it will, no, it's not going to let me do that. Let's see if I can quit out of that 
and make my image large again. Um, okay, I've totally pressed the wrong button, um, but thank you to Penelope for posting the link. So the aim of Art Down the Hill, like last year, is for us to achieve a critical mass of advocacy for the arts in all the ways that we do that. It is just as much about galvanising us and each other as it is about um, dominating social media on every platform that we can muster, as well as uh, securing some great media articles um, that give us a day of making uh, clear and constructive vision statements about the value of the arts. We've talked a lot in the past about how the arts create our future. We've been talking about this a lot through COVID-19. We've talked about and there's a number of specific things that NAV has been advocating for both during the pandemic, um, but also um, more broadly, um, you know, as that set of things that, that we prioritise advocating for. Um, there's also a lot of things that are important to you. The idea for Arts Down the Hill is for us to express a strong and visible diversity of views that are constructive, that are clear and that are compelling. All the things we've talked about over the last couple of months about how good advocacy is unique because it's yours. It, it can make a critical argument, but it doesn't switch people off uh, by being uh, insulting or whingy. It gives people a sense of the artist's vision, of your vision. It gives people an idea of why investment in the arts is important. And it does that in your own, in your own terms. Um, what we're asking um, for you to jump on with us this year is um, register to be part of Arts Down the Hill so that we can connect you with a bunch of uh, social media tips and tiles and all sorts of things. Or if you're also interested in being a media spokesperson, then please um, tick that box and apply when you when you follow through to that link. And we will have, um, I believe it is in a couple of Thursdays time, but we'll let you all know that. Thanks, Penelope, for just posting the Survey Monkey link. We're going to have an extra session on how to be a media spokesperson. And that will be led by um, Jane Morey from Morey Media, who was an artist publicist, who we heard from, you know, a few weeks ago when we had that really interesting conversation um, with uh, Abdul Abdullah about what had happened with that political uh, appropriation of his work. And thank you to Penelope for posting. The deadline is the 31st of July. So we've got time to tally you all up and all work together on that. Um, of course, everyone can and should participate in Arts Down the Hill by simply using the hashtag. Uh, but if we want that extra intensive um, of, um, of applying everything we've been developing for the last couple of months, then please, please join us. Ah, oh, Kaz has just said she's had to reconnect 20 times, um, praying for great communications. Can you imagine how bad it was in the bushfires? My goodness, it is just, you know, the digital divide in Australia, I really worry, is worsening. And I'm so glad and, and really grateful, Kaz, that you've persevered uh, because that's very, very good of you. Um, so next week, we've got Helen O'Neill joining us so that we can talk about how to plan a meeting with a politician. The week after, we're gonna have our entire session um, uh, just preparing for Arts Day on the Hill. The week after that, the 12th of August, um, we'll be, um, you know, getting into that uh, and, and planning Arts Day on the Hill. God, it really is that far away, isn't it? Yeah, so next week is Helen, the week after we're preparing. The week after that is Arts Day on the Hill, the 12th of August. And then the week after that, uh, we're gonna do some debriefing as well. Um, as Penelope points out, the kit is available just for financial NAVA members only. As I was saying earlier, these workshops with the, uh, with the generosity of the Daniel Beeson Foundation, we have been providing the workshops free of charge for everyone. But to be true to and, and uh, honour our first and foremost commitment to our members as a membership-based organisation, the kit is available only for NAVA members. Uh, and as Penelope points out, membership starts at just seven fifty a month. Now, before we say bye, I noticed there have been a few comments on um, 
the chat from earlier about our announcement on Monday that it is soon time for me to say goodbye to Nava and the amazing uh, people that I've had the deep honour of working with for the last uh, three years and longer for many of us. It is a time of big cultural change all over the world and it's an opportunity for a dynamism of leadership to continue in a refreshed way. I'm enormously excited about Nava's next steps. I'm incredibly excited um, that that will be led uh, under the leadership of Penelope Benton as acting CEO uh, for six months through this period. Penelope is here with us. Penelope, if you want to jump on and say hi bye to everyone, uh, that would be super wonderful. But but um, understand also if if um, you're totally in, in in typing mode, which which is totally oh good it's here. I think you've all met Penelope before. Hi everybody. Thanks. <laughs> and so um, there are a lot of conversations that Penelope is going to ha be having with all of you in the time uh, coming up over the next few months and has been having with us for a long uh, time. Penelope, um, what's our focus for those next few months when we look at strategic planning but also the code of practice? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I hope the audio is all right because I've taken my ear things out but um yes absolutely yeah the focus of our next uh well the rest of this year is really on consultation for revising the code of practice and we're going to get much deeper into that work um as a as a priority at the same time that we um undertake some membership surveys and research with you and um and yeah, do do some major strategic planning for Nava's next chapter. It's a very full five months ahead. A very full five months ahead and a lot of really intensive member engagement. There really has never been a better time to join Nava to shape not just uh, the next steps. Uh, for this incredibly important organisation, not only to shape um, the code of practice and influence best practice for the sector and for the industry, but of course to keep amplifying your voice and developing your voice. So on that note, we will say bye all. We've got a whole minute over time, according to my little device here. Everyone, we're going to see you next week. Next week is Helen O'Neill. She is the last of our guests. So we're going to look at how to plan a meeting with a politician and then go into some a lot more detail um, around Art Stay on the Hill. Um, and after next week, you'll have just still a couple more days to register and join us. Thanks so much, everyone, for this evening. Thanks, Penelope. Thank you. A pleasure and, to be here. And we'll see you all this time next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, and I've just noticed that Helen O'Neill was with us this evening. <laughs> I'd only just noticed that now. Sorry, Helen. <laughs> See you next week. Bye, everyone.